Hey guys, this is VM Joshi with Superior North, and today we are going to evaluate uh, CVS. So our goal here is to find the intrinsic value and how a value investor would actually look at a company. So our goal today, CVS, and initially we start off by looking at the revenue, right? The, that is the top line, that is what the total sales are, what the company is making. As you can see, the number has been growing every year, pretty much. Uh, you know, it, in 2010, it was about $96,000. And in 2019, it's uh, $256,000. And if we look at the bottom line, that has grown as well. Uh, we see that uh, in 2018, it looks like there was a negative year. But I think this is when uh, CVS ended up uh, buying or uh, acquiring Aetna. The insurance company so uh, that might be the reason why we see a bump in CVS's net income in 2018 however uh, if we just disregard this one number we can see that the trend is upward facing the book value per share has been growing steadily and so has the free cash flow so as a value investor you look at the free cash flow uh, because that's how much money is left over at the end of the day once all the expenses are paid so this is a very important number and uh, even uh, warren buffett says that the way he evaluates a company is by looking at the free cash flows and then he looks at the free cash flows at the rate it's growing and how much it would grow in the future and then he discounts back to the present value and that's uh, pretty much what discounted cash flow is so um, it's good to see that the free cash flow has been growing the other thing uh, we can look at are the uh, shares outstanding. We can see that uh, throughout the years, CVS had been purchasing back its, sh its shares since uh, the outstanding shares were decreasing until 2018. And then uh, we see that uh, there was an increase in the numbers of shares outstanding. So it looks like there might have been some equity financing uh, that uh, CVS did, maybe uh, to compensate for the liabilities that were increased uh, when CVS purchased Aetna. If we look at the financial health of the company, we set, see that the current ratio is at 0 0.98 in the most recent quarter. Ideally, we want this number to be one, at least greater than one. And uh, what the current ratio tells me is that, uh, does the company have enough current assets to pay off its current liabilities. If it does, then it would be a, a ratio of one. What a ratio of less than one tells me is that there are more current liabilities than current assets. So CVS would have to find out other ways to pay off its current assets because uh, liabilities, I should say, uh, because it does not have enough assets to meet its current liabilities. Financial leverage, it looks like uh, over the years, uh, CVS has been uh, more and more levered. And uh, if we look at debt to equity ratio, we want this ratio to be less than one um, because uh, we, we don't want debt to get too high uh, as compared to equity. Equity is what uh, a shareholder's uh, share is in the company, right? So uh, debt to equity, we want it to be less than one, ideally. And again, uh, a 1.2, I, I should say, is not too shabby. It's not like a 10 or a 15 that uh, you know things are getting out of control for CVS. If we quickly look at what uh, Walgreens is, just to get an idea of how uh, Walgreens is structured, we can see that it's 1.64. Uh, as you can see, we just a little bit ago uh, looked at the current ratio of uh, CVS and Walgreens, it's uh, it, it's, uh, it's uh, just looking at these two numbers, we can see that CVS has better numbers than uh, uh, Wal Walgreens as far as the current ratio and the uh, debt to equity is concerned. CVS, sorry. And if we look at the balance sheet we can see that we're probably going to see a hit taken in 2018 um, even with the current liability or total liabilities as you can see with the purchase of Aetna it took on some more debt and uh, 
what we expect to see that when a company purchases or does a vertical merger like that, um, which in the long run is beneficial for CVS. The other thing to note is that CVS's price to earnings PE ratio is uh, 10.3 as compared to uh, S&P 500's, which is 25. So it's, uh, I should say, if you look at, if you inv like to invest while thinking about mean reversion and how uh, compared to what the holistic, the top 500 companies are structured, if CVS is clearly undervalued as far as price to earnings uh, ratio is concerned. Same with price to book, it's only at a 1.2 times multiple, whereas uh, the rest of the 500, the other 500, top 500 companies in the United States are at a 3.5. We can look at uh, the 10K. So before we go to 10K, just looking at this, I feel pretty confident with the way CVS is structured. I think fundamentally it's a good company. I know that uh, the other metrics I would look at is uh, return on equity. And I can see that throughout the years, CVS has constantly been, you know, again and again, except of course 2018, which is a year when the acquisition happened. So I wouldn't really focus on this one year too much, but it has been always greater than eight. Hey guys, now let's quickly look at what the uh, risk factors are on the 10K, the annual report for uh, CVS, again, this is on uh, SEC's website. And quickly go to risk factors. The risks uh, that are on 10K are uh, risks of declining gross margins. I think that's uh, it's probably on each and every uh, company's uh, report. Um, efforts to reduce reimbursement levels and alter healthcare financing practices. A highly competitive business environment, risks related to compliance with a broad and complex regulatory framework. I think uh, it's uh, probably a standard uh, as far as what all the retail pharmacies or uh, pharmaceuticals in general are concerned. Risks of economy in general and the market we serve. Again, the more money people have, the more money they're going to spend. The economy declines, people are going to spend less, and CVS is going to make less. So it goes without saying, uh, with the health of the economy being a risk factor. The possibility of uh, client loss and or the failure to win new businesses, I think in the competitive environment, uh, it's probably on each and every company's 10K. Risk related to the frequency and rate of the introduction of generic drugs and brand, new, brand name prescription products. The failure or disruption of our information technology systems. Again, this is an important thing because in the 21st century, uh, we have a lot of cyber attacks. Uh, every company, especially with uh, health or vul vulnerable data, is always susceptible to uh, cyber attacks and uh, people want to get wrong information uh, via breaches. So, uh, definitely a risk factor. Risk relating to the market availability, suppliers, availability, supply, suppliers and safety profiles of uh, prescription drugs that we purchase and sell. Again, uh, I think with the COVID, this is more of a risk factor given the disruptions in the supply chain. Regulatory and business ch changes uh, related relating to our participation in Medicare Part D. I do not know what this is. <laughs> but uh, it's something to do with Medicare uh, eligible members. Reform of the uh, United States healthcare system, anything changes uh, by law, then uh, CBS would have to comply with it. Uh, possible uh, changes in industry practicing, uh, pricing benchmarks and drug, drug pricing generally. So I think uh, recently in, the, in Congress, there has been a big push of uh, bringing down uh, drug prices. So that might affect uh, CVS's bottom line as well uh, with the pricing changes because it might eat up into their margins. Product liability, uh, product recall, personal injury issues that could damage our reputation, uh, failure to maintain adequate liability insurance coverage. So again, that's just uh, making sure that uh, they don't get sued later down the line. And in case they do get sued, there's a risk that they may not have adequate insurance to cover themselves. Relationship with our retail and specialty pharmacy customers and the demand for our 
products and services, including pro propriety brands. And we're subject to payment related risks that could increase our uh, operating costs, expose us to fraud and, or theft, subject to uh, subject us to potential liabilities and disrupt our business operations. We may be unable to successfully integrate companies acquired by us. I think uh, that might allude to uh, Aetna, although I don't think they mentioned it on here. Our outstanding debt and associ associated uh, payment obligations could, amongst other things, limit our ability to make uh, incremental investments in our business. Risks related to the seasonality of our business, risks related to uh, litigation and other legal proceedings. So those are all the risk factors. I thought they were pretty generic as far as uh, what a retail pharmacy would have. And uh, now that we took a look of all the risks, I, th I think I'm pretty confident uh, with the risk factors that this company has. They're legitimate, but at the same time, they're manageable. And uh, the fact that CVS is aware of these risks, uh, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, I could not find any contingent liabilities on this uh, list. I tried to uh, do a control F on uh, contingent liabilities, but couldn't really find it. So we can move on to uh, finding the intrinsic value of... Uh, so I need to quickly uh, show you guys where I will be getting my free cash flow numbers from. So I'm again on um, CVS Health Morningstar, uh, key ratios under financials, uh, the free cash flow right here. Th this is the numbers that I will be using. Uh, for my DCF analysis, I will be using the trailing 12 months of uh, $13,628. Uh, again, this is in uh, millions. So um, again, this is the line that is of concern as far as uh, what we will be using for analysis. And the growth, um, you can see overall, uh, it's definitely greater than 3%, but conservatively, I will be using 3% for my um, cash flow year over year growth. Um, so off to the fundamentals of intrinsic value. At the discounted cash flow analysis for CVS, uh, we're using the 13,628 number that we got from Morningstar for the trailing 12 months of free cash flow. We're using the annual growth rate of free cash flow of 3%, a discount rate of 10%, 2% long-term growth rate, and uh, 1,311, uh, again, this is in millions, of outstanding shares. Uh, this is uh, what the outstanding shares are as of uh, 2020. And the long-term uh, debt is at 64,699. I think this is in millions as well. And I got this number from the balance sheet uh, under the liability section. So what happens is I'm, I'm these, this is the information that I'm giving uh, for my DCF calculation to work. And the way it works it is uh, I have uh, my discounted free cash flow, what it would be after 10 years. And then I'm discounting at the, I'm assuming that at the rate at which CVS is growing, if it were to grow into perpetuity, uh, this is the amount that uh, the company would be generating as far as free cash flow is concerned. I sum those two numbers up and I get my intrinsic value. Now I subtract my uh, long-term debt from this number, 64,000, I subtract it uh, and uh, I divide it by the shares outstanding. That way you know what the intrinsic value is per share. And that is how I get 68 Point sixty six dollars as of uh, August 10th, 2020, it's hovering around $65. So uh, the intrinsic value is well above that number. Okay, now let's look at what the expected rate of return would be. So the information that I'm using is the past 10 year free cash flow numbers. This right here is what I got from uh, Morningstar from 2010 to 2019. As you can see, the trend is upward facing. And the information that I'm inputting is I'm assuming that the free cash flow is going to grow at a 3% rate. And the probability of this, I'm assuming, is 10%. I'm also inputting that my most likely 
uh, free cash flow uh, growth rate is going to be at negative 1%. The probability of that is 65%. And uh, a negative 8% growth, and the probability of that is 25%. As you can see, these are the three bands that I'm getting at different probabilities. And so accounting for these probabilities, this is what my free cash flow is most likely going to look like 10 years into the future. Again, I'm using aggressive numbers. I'm assuming that it's going to go down rather than go up. So it's unlikely that it's going to happen, but um, you never know. So I'm assuming that this company is going to decline. Uh, CBS is going to decline 10 years from now. I'm also inputting the numbers of shares outstanding. At uh, this is again, as of 2020, the current share price is uh, $65.71. And once I take all of this into account, if I were to invest into CVS at $65.71, my expected rate of return is at 9.6%, uh, which in my opinion is really good given uh, how low bonds are yielding right now. And you know, close to a 10% expected rate of return in a uh, inflated stock market, uh, Holistically, this this clearly tells me that CVS is undervalued at $65. So uh, that is my expected rate of return calculation. Okay, so uh, at $65, uh, we can safely say that CVS is undervalued. We notice that using a 10% discount rate uh, for the DCF analysis, the intrinsic value comes out to about $88. And also, the expected rate of return if we were to purchase CVS at this level is about 10%, which is well in access to what any government bond is going to yield. So overall, um, if I were to give it a choice, if I to buy CVS or not, I would pull the trigger and say yes. And that is not to say that the price is not going to go lower. It could certainly go uh, well below $65. Uh, all I'm saying is uh, at the current valuations, the CVS is undervalued. And if it were to go lower, then I'm mo most likely going to buy more. So that's all, guys. Hopefully uh, you found this video interesting and helpful. Uh, please do like, uh, share, and subscribe to this video. Thanks. Bye.